Welcome to Software and Database Refactor Patterns. Uh, my name is Bill Penberthy, and I'm a .NET developer advocate with AWS. So that means my job is really working with .NET developers and helping them understand how best to take advantage of AWS services. Uh, we then take that interaction back into our internal teams and we work with them to make our .NET developers experience better. Prior to joining AWS, I probably had spent, oh wow, um, 25 plus years in software with most of that doing uh, development with companies ranging from new startups to government agencies to established enterprises. Um, this gave me a lot of exposure to how useful software patterns are when developing, uh, regardless of what industry or company, what the level of technical maturation in the company is, what development languages or frameworks you use. Software patterns are a way of showing intent. When your intent is to refactor your software, uh, such as moving to microservices or something else like that, it makes sense to evaluate your process in the light of well-reasoned refactor software patterns. And that's kind of what we're gonna go over today. So the first thing we'll do is we'll start by spending some time with some, mad, uh, with some major software refactor patterns. We'll then tackle some database refactor patterns. We'll then briefly go over some of the other things to consider when choosing refactor patterns, um, external influences and things that could, could impact the way that you would adopt your refactor patterns. And lastly, we'll do a quick walkthrough and example using the patterns in, in real life. So let's jump right into this and start going through some of the most common software refactor patterns. So these strategies or refactor design patterns are different ways in which you can uh, change your system as you consider the evolution of, of your application and your entire system. And this is certainly not a, a complete list, but they offer different approaches for refactoring systems. These patterns are also not exclusive. You'll find as you work through the changes that you'll use many of these, if not all, sometimes together. So the patterns that we're gonna go over for software refactoring today are Strangler Fig, Branch by Abstraction, Parallel Run, Change Data Capture, UI Composition, and Decorating Collaborator. And just as a warning, as I go through these, you'll see that I'll typically be using a, a let's go to microservices as I describe their practical use. I'm kind of taking that approach because this is the type of change that I've I've seen the most frequently over the last five or six years. Um, basically taking those old big old applications that were in vogue a while ago and breaking them down into more discrete manageable parts. Uh, the user interface, whether it's uh, web-based or mobile or desktop, might still have a lot going on with it, but uh, the business logic's being pulled out of that application and deployed in a way that gives more granular control over the process or set of code. So that's kind of what most of my diagrams and, and, and everything that we're gonna talk through will show, but that's not necessarily the only way that we'll, we'll use these patterns and we'll talk about those as we go through there. So the most well-known of these refactor patterns is the Strangler Fig. Um, implementing this approach typically means that you'll create a new system running in parallel with your existing system, as kind of shown by the uh, purple Pentagon in the center. Over time, you'll move responsibility and functionality from the current system to the new system. The primary differentiator in the Strangler Fig is that it really depends from a, on a call from outside of the system that will eventually go to the new system. So when you completely finish up, you'll basically have a large number of, uh, of purple pentagons with little blue boxes in each one, and you may or may not have any functionality left over in that what we've got labeled there is the monolith. Also, as the slide kind of indicates, the external calling system may need to be changed because they have to now call some different part of the business than they did historically. So let's take a look at what this could look like. So we have a company that builds and sells an online product, say a, a software that you use to build mind maps. Their management platform where visitors would go and look at videos, read about the software, et cetera, is all in a customized off-the-shelf e-commerce system that was, that was really designed to sell things that would be pulled off a rack and shipped. The company's been successful, so they're looking at redoing this management system in a more, in a more customized and distributed approach. One of the first things that they realized as they were breaking out their ubiquitous language or their common language that they share with the business 
was that there's a disconnect in how the business saw what should be happening from what the technology was requiring. And that was the concept of a purchase. So a customer purchased the software and it was immediately available. There were no order details or other concepts like that. You either had bought the software or you hadn't. Since the purchase is a core concept of the business, it's basically what their business runs on, it was determined that this would be the first thing that was changed. So if you take a look at the screen, you'll see a really simple snippet from the order controller. If you're familiar with uh, ASP.NET Web API, you can see that the actions in this snippet will be listening restfully at API slash order. So that's what we're going to change. So in the case of a strangler fig pattern, you would replace the area that would take the call. In this case, we simply created a new set of endpoints that were listening restfully at, at API slash purchase. Assuming that the purchase and the order look similar, this call may not require any changes on the client's end other than pointing to a new endpoint. And theoretically, you could eliminate that need by putting some kind of a, uh, a reverse proxy in there that would redirect the call to the appropriate place. So for the string of fig pattern, this is really what we did. We replaced a a monolithic service dot controllers dot order controller dot get with a, a sneakily named microservice dot controllers dot purchase controller dot get. This new service with these new sets of endpoints are the new microservice. So as you can see, there is one very big requirement for the Strangler fig pattern to be successful, and that's that you have to have the ability to clearly map the inbound functionality that you want to refactor. If your code being migrated is deeper so that there's not a direct path to it from the external system, or if there are existing calls coming to it from both inside and outside of your system, the strangler fig is not your best approach. Obviously, this is, you know, back to what I'd mentioned about microservice, this is a pattern that's really clear when you're looking at building microservices from a, a monolithic application. However, there's another way to look at the strangler fig, and that's within the system. We all know that a well-designed system has its own layers, up to N of them, that in many ways can be looked at as discrete APIs. These discrete API calls can be strangler figged away in the same, same fashion that we just talked about with the external calls. And that's kind of what this slide is showing. The existing call is no longer shown as coming from outside the application. Instead, it's defined as being a, just a consumer of that service, um, most generally from a layer that's higher up in the system. And in this case, the purple Pentagon is not necessarily a new microservice. It is instead just somewhere else that's going to be doing the processing. But like the microservice approach that I showed earlier, it still requires that you change the existing call to go somewhere else. And that may not always be ideal. So in that case, if that's kind of what you're looking at, you should probably evaluate the, uh, the next pattern, the branch by abstraction pattern. This is very similar to the strangler fig pattern. However, the strangler fig pattern, it really, it depends upon external calls coming into the system, while the branch by abstraction approach stays completely within your application and does not require any changes to external systems outside that one application area that you're refactoring. Now, many people combine both of these architectural approaches and call it the strangler pattern, or sometimes strangler fig pattern but they're actually uniquely different approaches to solving complex refactorings. And I, and I really feel that it's important to talk about these patterns separately and using the appropriate terminology. And hopefully you'll see why as we go through this. In the branch by abstraction pattern, you determine what functionality is gonna be removed, and then you build an abstraction layer for it. You slide that abstraction into the code and you ensure all of your consuming code is calling that abstraction. Once all of the code to be replaced has been updated to use the uh, abstraction, then you can start replacing that implementation. Um, the image shows the implementation being replaced by a microservice, but it could be anything that's different than what's already being called. You've probably seen this approach multiple times. I know I've seen it quite a bit. Um, most commonly when we were implementing a repository for data persistence, um, by abstracting out those crudly calls, you can you can do things like switch in and out databases, uh, or you can even turn your persistence implementation into a call to a REST service rather than to a database. This approach is also common if you're doing a, uh, 
a refactor with the hope of moving to inversion of control or dependency injection. So in this case, we're looking at an implementation where the order service, uh, basically the class that has a lot of the business logic for orders, is newed up. This makes changing the behavior difficult because it means that you would have to change the order service itself. In the branch by abstraction pattern, you have more flexibility by adding in the ability to uh, kind of switch back and forth between multiple code lines. You do that by putting in an abstraction. You can then have your old way, i.e. the order service, and then you could build a new one, which in this case would be the purchase implementation. So this is what it would look like after the abstraction. We know that we have an abstraction, the iPurchase server, that for the time being will be implemented by the same order service that we saw in the last slide. Once we get the new service completed, we now have a, uh, a way to switch back and forth. We change the runtime to use the new functionality that implements the iPurchase service. And if it works, eh, great. If for some reason it doesn't, then we can switch back to the previous implementation and everything should still work just like it did earlier. Also, note how I named the abstraction for what its future implementation will be. This helps bring the idea of the future and the ubiquitous language, how you're gonna be communicating between the business and, the, and technology in sooner, even if it's in an area that'll probably be replaced. Uh, I'm a big fan of ubiquitous language and getting on the same language or the same understanding of uh, of words and terminology that between the technology and the business. And the more you practice it, the better. So the branch by abstraction layer. Adding in a new abstraction layer that will allow you to replace the implementation behind the abstraction. Now, however you replace that implementation is up to you. Here we show it as a microservice. So the next pattern is parallel run. Strangler fig and branch by abstraction allow old and new code to coexist in production at the same time. However, you generally only run one path at a time. Uh, typically there'd be a switch somewhere like a configuration file or in the database that tells the system to use either the, the new or old branches of the code. If the new branch breaks, you switch back to the old one and everything should be running like it was before. Parallel run does this a bit different in that it runs through both the old and the new at the same time and then compares the results. I mean, it sounds a little crazy though, but can think about this situation. Your current state is a web application that you want to move to microservices. Of course, my running example. And you want each of those, uh, those services to be responsible for its own data management. This would be a very good way to test the system. Let the system you know works continue to do the heavy lifting, but completely exercise the new system as if it's also doing the work. And then you compare the results. Your comparison engine could be as simple as a SQL script to compare uh, data, or it could be as complex as a fully running service that's listening to database calls and event queues or whatever you've got going on and comparing those results. Whatever makes the most sense based off of the changes that you're planning on making. Also, the last time that I used this approach, we were able to find a lot of edge cases that were missed when we were rebuilding out the application. Um, some of those were by design. We decided that we just weren't gonna support that anymore, but some were coincidental. Also, we found several instances where the current system, the, the older system, was actually doing work incorrectly. It's just that no one had noticed it. So I highly recommend Parallel Run if you have the ability to be able to Design your system in such a way as to support both the old one and the new way. So this example shows a, a simple version of a comparison engine that's calling that that I've that's kind of called out there and that's the center part of the image. Oh, excuse me. Um, this SQL script compares the number of orders that were found for a date range between two different tables and two different databases. More robust versions of the engine would perform more robust analysis. Once you're confident that your comparison engine is measuring the items correctly and demonstrating that the old and new approaches are showing equivalent results, you're able to move to that far right part of the, uh, the image and switch completely away from the old functionality to your shiny new functionality. So the next pattern is change data capture. All of the other patterns that we talked about so far rely on 
on changing or acting upon calls made into an existing system. In the change data capture approach, we instead listen for and react to changes in the data. While this is generally a transitive pattern, i.e. It's, it's something that you would implement for a while during a conversion, it can also become part of your move to a more distributed approach, um, especially in systems where more than one application using various data tables, uh, especially when, say, you're, you're working with a third-party software package and you don't have the ability to make any changes to that code. So this approach relies upon support from within the database management system. Uh, for example, SQL Server allows you to understand table data change events. In that case, you could take advantage of that change and either push the data to a different database or send a message that talks about what data was changed, whatever makes the most sense for the architecture that you're, that you're moving to. So UI composition. This is an implementation approach that takes takes advantage of various UI implementation patterns such as MVP, MVC, and MVVM so that new functionality is added or replaced by, by splitting the calls at the UI level and splicing the results back into the data being presented to the UI. Uh, basically, you'll split out the data from the new service that's being deployed and in your management framework, uh, such as your controller and an MVC app, call the new service and stitch that data into the data being presented to the UI. The source of the new information that's being captured and displayed could be anything, whether it's a newly created microservice, a refactored microservice, some new body of code, a new library that you've built. Anything that you could do for that, it then becomes the source of the data that you would split into the UI. Excuse me. <laughs> it's a shame being a developer and having to talk this long. It's just not right. Um, so on the screen is a simple ASP.NET MVC controller that gets some information from the business layer based upon uh, based upon the session ID. Yeah, you gotta love server-side state. Um, we're adding new functionality in by an additional service call whose results are being passed into the view model. Uh, we've been able to add this composition by you know, adding a new property on the checkout view model that gets passed to the view, instantiating the controller with an additional service, in this case, the content service, uh, we've then used that new service to populate the new property on the checkout view model. And then, which we don't see, we've updated the UI to use the new information in the view model. So the last design pattern for software that we're going to talk about is the decorating collaborator approach. So this approach uses the decorator design pattern to, uh, to take advantage of the results of your code. If any of you have written uh, an HTTP handler for IIS, for example, then you've implemented a type of decorating collaborator, um, especially if you've done it using the HTTP result rather than the HTTP request. If you're not running IIS, then this would normally be done by creating a proxy between the caller and the current system. The proxy would receive the incoming request, pass it through to the current system, and then when the response, the response comes back, the, uh, the proxy would call a different system. This slide shows an example of the proxy calling a microservice as the response gets returned to the proxy by the server. Generally, the call to the microservices that, that's orchestrated within the proxy is asynchronous and will complete on its own, so that it doesn't need to be any additional waiting. However, obviously that's not always true. Sometimes there will be a, a asynchronous, not an asynchronous, asynchronous call that can affect the user's experience. So I mentioned earlier how it is not uncommon when a team uses more than a single pattern when performing a refactor. Here are some of the most common combinations that I've seen out in the wild. As we go through these in a little bit more detail, you'll see how even more patterns can be brought into play as you start to determine both your end state and your implementation approach. Because usage of these patterns does not mean that the evolution is going to end once you get the pattern implemented. Many times, a pattern is really used as a part of an implementation path and not as the full expected end result. It's okay to use these patterns in a transitive nature to support the migration from your, your current system to your, your future system, your refactor of a complex system. And so this is the most common combination. In fact, I think I mentioned it earlier, many times when you see strangler pattern uh, referred to 
they really are talking about this combination. And yes, this is very close to the branch by abstraction by itself, with the only difference being that the call is coming in from an external source rather than the internal source that you would expect on the branch by um, abstraction. So as you can imagine, this combination of patterns also works really well as a transitive pattern. If you take a look at the items on the screen, in this set of examples, the abstraction layer is built while the microservice is being built. Once both of those are built, you start moving the implementation from behind the abstraction layer to, in this case, the microservice. You then continue moving the functionality bit by bit until the whole set of functionality that you want to move has been finished. And yes, this is an implementation approach, which is why I said this works as a transitive pattern. The end result looks like what we saw in the last slide, but the process of getting there is more evolutionary. And this is a slightly different take on the combination of Strangler, Fig, and Branch by Abstraction, where the abstraction happens outside of the running application. Um, this approach means that there's no need to change the existing call, which could be important, especially if working with third parties may be calling into your system. So this approach is different from decorating collaborator, though, because in that pattern, the proxy takes the results of the call into the current application and sends it to the new microservice or new destination. So in effect, a decorating collaborator acts as, a, as an add-on to the current functionality. Um, in this case, you're basically redirecting it rather than adding it on. Also, as you may have picked up when going through the patterns, parallel run is not so much a, a development pattern really as it is an, impl or a, an evaluation approach. Highly recommended to run this for a while in production to evaluate whether or not your new system may be working appropriately. So we talked about software refactor patterns. Let's spend a little bit of time on database refactor patterns. So as we go through the database refactor patterns, there are a couple of things that you should consider when looking at patterns to use. The first is the differences between physical and logical database separation. I would say that the requirement that you should really consider is that of logical database separation at a minimum. We're going to talk about that more in the next few slides, but remember that the important thing is, at a minimum, perhaps some kind of a logical database separation as you look at how you're going to be refactoring your code. The next is the implementation approach that you're going to use. Um, if you're going to do a big bang approach where one release, you don't have a microservice and the next one you have a fully functional microservice or refactored set of code, then it's really not much of a concern. But if you're going to take an incremental approach to implementation, then you need to make that decision about whether you split the database first, the code first, or you split them both simultaneously. And then we also need to talk about consistency of the data, whether or not you can support strong consistency or eventual consistency. So splitting the database first means that you define the data to be used by the microservice and you segregate that data first. This approach gives you the opportunity to, to iterate through changes while supporting data reversion if something goes wrong. Consider a system where there's a lot of intertwining within the data. Uh, say a single data table, say the product, it contains pieces of information that's useful for many different parts of the business. Uh, let's say it has data about who set in the last purchase order for it, or how many of those items are left in inventory? Uh, what employee did the most recent physical inventory count or its location in the warehouse? All of that information makes sense to be part of the product table, but not every piece of your business is gonna need all of that information. So with this approach, you determine the data needed by, by your microservice or the part of the code that you're refactoring, and you start pulling it out. As you pull it out, by watching it iterate through the system, you know, you'll likely find some places where either data was missed or data was moved in that was unnecessary, and then you can fix that. The next approach, splitting the code first, is probably the most common incremental approach, and most of the patterns that I'll talk about moving forward really support this best. 
An advantage is that it helps you understand the data definition because you create the model with the functioning data service. By starting at the model first, you're able to identify just the data that's needed. However, and I, and I, and I really want to call this out, many teams tend to stop here. They may have a new microservice or a new set of functionality that they can deploy independently. It's probably more performant, maybe better testable. So they deprioritize the last step of moving the data. However, that means that it's not completely independent, nor is it completely testable, nor is it actually in full control of its responsiveness. If you get this far, sure, it's better than it was, but it's not as good as it could be. And then the last uh, approach would be splitting the database and the code together. In this case, you basically go from having one data source and no microservices to a functional microservice that controls its own data. Thus, the only incrementing that you would do is going through building out additional functionality. Now, this is generally a much bigger step that takes more work, and it also seems to require a, a really rich understanding of your business domain and what you're trying to accomplish. In many ways, this may be the most ideal pattern, but it's also the most difficult one to, to do. So also, I kind of mentioned it during the beginning of this, but something to consider when doing database refactoring is whether or not the refactored database can get by with eventual consistency instead of strong consistency. Not every part of your business needs to know everything about the data models within the other parts of the business at all times. Instead, they simply need to eventually know some of the things. If you look at the time graph on the slide, uh, the column of green dots demonstrates strong consistency. That's what a system with a single shared database has now, because all of the data is stored in a, in a single place. It so becomes available to every other consumer of the data at the same time. Once the save is committed, everyone knows about it. The only lack of consistency is during the milliseconds of that database transaction. Eventual consistency is different. That's the staggered orange dots. It means that data will be consistent eventually. And there'll be some time before all of the other uh, systems and business areas understand that data. And the meaning of eventually is something that you consider when you architect out your system. So in my mind, eventual consistency is important for any effort that expects decoupling. So if you're doing any kind of refactoring in which decoupling your, your business is, is a strong consideration, then this is something that you should be thinking of as you, as you think about how you're going to implement your refactoring approaches, because it provides the business area the most control over itself. The first bullet there pretty much tells the main story. If strong consistency was required, uh, my a two business areas or microservices needed to know the same information at the same time, that means that either one of those business areas has to have enough knowledge about the other so they can go get the information from the other service, or they both have to access the same data store. So doing that means changes in one business area, such as to a table, could impact another business area. And this is where the business area or microservice having its own data really started to speak to me. It enforces decoupling. Shared databases means you generally have to worry about other systems when making a change in one. And that, and that makes me uncomfortable. I'd really have uh, appreciate my code being a little bit more distinct than that. Because um, I don't want changes in one system to affect another system. Even if those systems are still part of a monolithic application, I'd rather have them be decoupled enough that one change won't affect another one. Also, one of the implementation paths that when talking about eventual consistency is through messaging. So I thought I'd throw this in here and we'll talk about it briefly. Uh, messaging is a system that are, an architectural approach that allows for communications between multiple interested parties. There are many different examples of messaging platforms, RabbitMQ, Apache Kafka, AWS, we have a couple of those products as well. There are different behavioral approaches such as PubSub or message queues. But what messaging provides to distributed architecture, um, such as microservices, could not be overstated. First, uh, you know, messaging 
uh, system decouples providers from consumers. This means that a consumer does not have to know where to go to find the information that they care about. They just need to be able to recognize that information as it goes by. Second is that the use of messaging can provide simple horizontal scaling, especially in the case of microservices, because if the if the machines that are handling the messages become overworked, eh, you just add more. Uh, you know, platform and language integration, typically with messaging, you don't have to worry about them all being written in the same language or running on the same operating system. Messaging queue provides reliable communication because it takes a store and forward approach where the message is, is stored in the queue and then forwarded to all of the subscribed listeners. And you'll find that messaging is an ideal approach when needing to work with disconnected systems that may or may not always have communications. Uh, using that store and forward approach means that regardless of when the system connects to the, the network, be able to catch up on all the messages they've missed. And the last is that the messaging system automatically acts as a mediator. And this is what I really appreciate almost the most about this, is that with the mediator pattern, communication between different microservices is encapsulated within a mediator object. These microservices or business areas no longer need to communicate directly with each other, but instead communicate through the mediator. This reduces the dependencies between communicating systems, thereby reducing coupling. Excuse me again. <laughs> With this, if an application becomes disconnected from the others, it need only reconnect to the messaging system, not to all of the other messaging applications. Cuts down a lot of that interdependency that you tend to worry about when you have larger, more complicated and interconnected applications. So let's go into the database refactor patterns and talk about those now. So we'll talk about shared database, database view, data synchronization, and current application as data source. So the first database pattern is shared database. I know it kind of sounds horrible, and I talked earlier about how it may not be the best idea. However, there are times when it does make the most sense. The first is if your business needs to not support eventual consistency. And there are cases where that can happen. Um, the next is if you're simply using it as an intermediate or transient approach with code first. So there'll be implementation needs that may require your, your new service to initially access the existing database for a period, then switch over to a different data store as you continue to work through the refactor. Another time, oh, excuse me. Uh, nothing like you guys get to watch me drink coffee from that far away. <clears throat> Another time where it makes sense um, would be when the data contains something that's shared across multiple microservices and rarely changes. A list of states and provinces, for example, would fit that example. Sure, you can recreate that list in multiple parts of the business, but why? This approach is database view. <clears throat> this pattern relies on a shared database, but it uses views to present the data differently. Uh, this database view, which in SQL Server supports both read and write, can carry out transformation between different data designs, or it can simply be used to help support decoupling. This could be done through either a code first or database first, but it's probably most common to do this as a code first. What you do is treating the view as a contract basically means that the underlying structural changes should not be making breaking changes in the view. It also assumes that the view will support both reading, writing, and editing. And of course, assuming your database supports the use of a view. <coughs> Man, I apologize. This pattern also works without the use of database views, however, through the use of CQRS or command query responsibility segregation. In CQRS, reads and writes are broken apart. By separating these two, you allow them to be managed differently. You can uh, scale reads or writes differently, use different schemas. Uh, you know, you could denormalize for reads, which will also lead to simpler queries. Also, segregating the read and write sides can result in models that are more maintainable and flexible. Uh, generally, you'll find that most of the complex business logic goes into the write model. The read model can be relatively simple, and there can be multiple write models and read models. However, the separation of concerns is happening. 
And that really is an a, is a implementation pattern that you could use that's similar, they're, that's literally the same as a database view. So the next pattern is data synchronization. In this approach, which is generally a database first approach, the current application of the new uh, microservice or business area have their own data sources. However, there's a third party application, say a, a background worker like shown on the slide, that ensures that the data stays in sync between the two different data sources. This is also an approach that you can use transiently. If your end result is going to a, uh, an eventual consistency through message approach or something like that, an intermediate step could be an implementation of the data synchronization pattern. If your microservice ends up being completed before your messaging framework, you can start with this pattern and migrate over to a messaging-based eventual consistency model rather than this background worker-based eventual consistency model. Also, the change data capture plat, uh, pattern is, is frequently used when the uh, when you're interacting with a third party system that you don't have control over the code, but instead you wanna take, uh, take advantage of any background data changes. The last one is the current application as a data source. This is an interesting pattern. Uh, it's generally a transient pattern as it's not something that's recommended as a long-term solution, because uh, it's kind of backwards from our overall goal of a refactor. In this case, you would basically create a new endpoint in the current application that provides the appropriate information. Ideally, the contract that you would define for this would be the same as the contract that you anticipate using for your, for your new system as you're rolling it out, so that your only change really would be where you're gonna make that call. It seems weird on the first look, but if you think through what a complete representation of a, especially a fully distributed architecture would look like, becomes obvious that there's a lot of different development that needs to happen, and not all of it can run in, in, uh, in parallel. That means that it may be in your best interest to use a pattern such as this, rather than needing to rely on enough services to have launched so that you can get the appropriate support. Use your existing application and the business logic that's already in there as a crutch as you continue to build out the rest of your systems. So we've defined some implementation points, talked about some patterns. Um, these patterns help you understand reasoned and thought out ways to evolve your software architecture. But there are other things that need to be considered because they affect your ability to implement these patterns. Let's look at those now. So these are the other considerations that we'll talk about. Things that may impact your ability to succeed when considering your architectural approaches. These include equipment and software, uh, the experience and knowledge that your team has as well as their day-to-day -day routine, and your internal systems administration experience and knowledge. So the first one is your equipment and software. This is a very common problem when you're looking at refactors, especially if they're designed to support scalability, redundancy, and any changes in deployments or DevOps. Why? Because many of those approaches mean running more systems, such as web servers. Uh, and depending your, upon your setup, this can be very difficult. Each of these new systems will require you know, some kind of processing and storage. So even if you're rolling your own virtual machines in your private data center, there's likely gonna be need for you to, to have additional computing capacity. Those machines then may need additional licensing. If you're a .NET framework shop, then those new VMs may need to have Windows on them. So you'll incur uh, additional licensing costs just for the OS. That doesn't even include any other licensing that you may need to manage, uh, just simply because you've increased the number of processors that are running services. And obviously one of the biggest ones will be the experience and knowledge of your developers. Developers are the most confident when working in those frameworks in which they're already comfortable, just like everybody else. Thus, if your developers have spent a decade writing, say, new functionality into a large monolithic application, then moving to a more service-oriented architecture such as microservices may very well be very jarring. Same with potential database changes. Moving from a relational database to a NoSQL or even key value or some other purpose-built database is a really different design paradigm. And a different design paradigm is gonna lead to some cognitive dissonance. And nothing really talks like a, 
a different design paradigm than a change in domain or the interpretation about how you're either going to run your business or how you're going to write the software to fulfill your business. And when you're not only affecting the way that they approach their coding process, but also maybe making changes that impact the way that they do their day-to-day -day work, such as even changes how they check in code and manage their code, or even more importantly, how they run their debugging and tracing as they do their work, those little things add complexity to the refactor attempt and increase the chance of failure. So they should really be taken into account when you, uh, when you look at what software refactor patterns you think make the most sense for the changes that you want to fill. The last main area to consider is, what uh, is when your proposed refactor includes changes that may be out of your current system administrator's knowledge. Imagine being a system administrator that's used to running virtual machines, but being asked to pick up containers or in supporting serverless functions. Or your sysadmins are used to running and optimizing big Windows web server VMs and now have to do Linux VMs or even Linux containers. With all of that, adding some additional new areas, such as how managing and supporting user rights and managing access may be different based upon the type of refactor that's being performed, None of these are really suggested to be showstoppers. They shouldn't stop your refactor, but they all indicate areas where external factors can influence the success of your refactor. So as you make your plans, you really should be considering these as well as the patterns that you want to follow. So we've talked some implementation points and talked some patterns. Let's get a little bit more into the actual use of these and look at a system. So there's two specific refactors that I want to talk about. The first is within a web application, and the second is from a SOA type web service to a microservice. So, the right side here is a bunch of servers, uh, represents the load balance big old web app, just kind of, you know, an old monolithic application that is calling to a service based or a service oriented architecture set of services behind it. And these are the communication lines that are going on. Um, the web app calls a lot of these services, but there's also a lot of service to service call going on as well. And that's just kind of nuts. Imagine how scary it would be to try to figure out how to add some new functionality into the purchasing module. How do you wedge that in there? What's with the current design approach, you could do anything to one module and it could potentially affect any of these other modules. And also what this diagram shows is how business rules tend to get scattered amongst different areas of the system. And this tends to be why you end up having to do a lot of refactors um, because your business rules end up getting scattered around and you need to be able to bring them back together. In this case, for example, there's orchestration going on in the web app as it determines what services to call, as well as all of the intercommunications that are going on. So this is what a typical request would look like. The big old web app would uh, call the user service for authorization and authentication. It then calls the customer service to get the customer information. Um, the website calls the order service with the order that the user submitted. The order service saves the information, calls the product information to decrement the available product count, and then calls the communication service to send the order confirmation email. Five different services are involved. Um, other business flows are very similar. In some of them, the website does some orchestration and then hands it off to a service. The service generally handles the persistence, then performs additional processing based upon whatever business rules were defined for that service. So this is what we're gonna refactor. So this is pretty much what a typical website, especially one that's server-side MVC based looks like. There's a bunch of client-side language in that hippie JavaScript stuff. There's the controller layer that accepts the user input and returns the UI elements. There's the business logic layer that does all the processing and orchestration. And you can kind of think of this as a model for that big old web application that I, that I showed earlier. So in this case, you need to add an abstraction layer between the controllers and the business logic. That's, you know, assuming that you don't already have one. <laughs> Ideally, you'll have one. It's amazing how many times we don't. Um, once you get that done, and you've verified that all the communications between the controller and the business logic pass through the abstraction layer, you then refactor the previous business layer to call the new microservice instead, assuming that that's how we're gonna be going through this, for those sections of the logic that care about that area. 
Though, to be honest, it could be debated as to whether or not it's a new service or simply a completely redone service, which we're going to look at now. Before we leave the slide, however, I want to call out a few things. The first is that while this abstraction layer in the slide seems to be completely between the controller and the business logic, it can simply start as the area that will cover the business logic that's going to be refactored. So if you think about, uh, we talked about the abstraction software pattern, you don't have to actually do it across everything. You just need to keep it above the uh, level in which you're going to try to abstract and refactor out. So this is what, it, and sorry, I'm starting to rush through it. It looks like I'm running out of time. And this is what these typical SOA web services look like. Traditional end tier layered architecture with data either coming from the database through the data persistence layer or from a different service through the cleverly named other services data. So this is what an idea what a SOA like service would look like after it's been refactored. First, we need to add a message handler because that's what we're going to use to do communication because eventual consistency is okay. Um, I put this up at the top because it's much like a request, even though it's rather than be an HTTP request, it's a request caused by a sent message. Um, we'll need to add a messaging layer to, to process outbound messages if the service is going to send any. And we will redo the persistence layer because we're no longer going to be saving information in the shared database, and our model is able to change because it only has to track the things it care about. Lastly, we'll need to refactor the business logic layer because all of the changes will be going on in this area. We're likely removing a lot of responsibility from the service because it doesn't belong here. There are things that the current version of the service is doing that it should not be doing in the future. Um, that means that I've seen it every time I've done this, that you'll probably end up, especially if you're looking to go to microservices, with many more services than what you had anticipated and what you're already running. This is, but what you're going to see is that the responsibilities around each of these microservices is going to be much more clear. So let's talk about what this would be like to refactor based off of the patterns that we talked about. First of all, we added in a message handler and updated the API, generally removing a bunch of endpoints that the refactored service wouldn't care about. Though to be honest, it's probably not removed, but it's instead moved to a different service. So let's not worry about those parts. Instead, let's look at the brand new messaging layer that we're adding in. How would this be added in? This is what we had, minus the API layer. This is the list of patterns. Which of them makes the most sense? If you're going to consider this specific case, adding in a new horizontal layer for messaging, which would be appropriate? Eh, Strangler fig doesn't work. Branch by abstraction works, so let's leave that. Parallel run, um, that may work, but in this case, it really isn't an implementation pattern. So let's drop that. Uh, change data capture. Uh, that's that's an interesting one. So we had the yellow box between the business layer and the persistence layer. But if we're actually flexible about this, then this could actually work. Um, we would essentially be switching those two boxes around. So let's keep this one in for a second. Um, UI composition. Yeah, I don't think that would help us in this route. Nor would decorating collaborator. Which kind of leaves us with two potential patterns to use in this case, branch by abstraction or change data capture. But if we're firm about adding the abstraction between the currently existing business logic and the persistence layer, you can re-implement that abstraction in the messaging layer and then pass the calls through using that same abstraction into the persistence layer, which is going to have to be redone anyway to save the new models to the new database system. So how could you do this iteratively? This is a lot of work. What can you do to make it more iterative? You could do that by keeping the persistence layer, evolve your business logic changes, implement change data capture, and that will manage the outbound messaging. So you'll take a code first approach. This allows you to get some benefits like the outbound messaging while still not having to complete the full set of work. You can release this, send messages, and then keep working on your refactor until you get to the point where your work is pretty much finished. And you've released, in this case, your new microservice through several iterations. So I know we tried to cover a lot of things in a short period. I appreciate your sticking with me, um, especially since we couldn't get as deep into the weeds as I imagine some of you were hoping. Um, any questions? Let's see if I can. <clears throat> 
figure out how to get the question pane up here. Also, if you're interested at all in what uh, AWS has going on in the .NET platform, make sure that you follow us, our .NET on AWS handle. That's where all of our releases and discussions, any things interesting that we're doing gets published there. <clears throat> 